So the topic I chose was one that I have over the last sort of year been um, thinking quite a lot about and has actually influenced a lot of my career decisions um, over the last, well, I'll say 24 months. Um, and really has to do with the role that biotech or commercial research um, potentially could play in building scientific capacity um, in Africa. So I thought it was Africa Day, so I tried to find a few facts um, about Africa that we may or may not know to sort of just launch, uh, launch this discussion. Um, I think it's quite well understood that Africa is the second largest continent. Um, we do have the world's longest river. Um, I actually did not know this till today, but actually Kilimanjaro is the world's tallest freestanding mountain. I didn't have time to look into what freestanding meant as opposed to not freestanding. But anyway, there you have it. According to the internet, um, Africa has the world's tallest freestanding mountain. Um, we have the world's largest hot desert. And it took me a while to ask myself what desert isn't hot, but then I figured maybe there are frozen deserts. So anyway, the Sahara is the world's largest hot desert. Um, we have greater than 3,000 ethnic groups on the African continent and speak between 1,500 to 2,000 languages. And I think those last two really hammer a theme that, I will, that is actually important for my company, but really the idea that Africa has the most genetically and in many ways culturally diverse population anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, that's not where the story ends. Africa is also known and perhaps unfortunately better known for some of its problems. Um, while we are home to around over, just over 16% of the global population, um, we also um, have, unfortunately, account for around 27% of disease burden. Um, and then most relevant to this talk today, um, we also account, unfortunately, for somewhere less than 2% of global research output. This number fluctuates these days between 2 to 3%, but still, we are way under 5% of global research output, um, despite having 27% of, um, of, of, of the globe's disease burden. Now, to put this in slightly more visual terms, um, this is a figure I pulled from a publication by Confraria and Wang, um, looking at scientific research, um, and in this case, primarily focusing on medical research. So the previous stats I showed were for research in general, this is focused primarily on medical research. And you can see Africa broken into four regions, east, north, south, and west and central. Um, and you can see that when it comes to world share of disability adjusted life years, so basically a way that we measure morbidity um, or disease, um, west and central Africa on their own account for almost 15% of the world's dailies. Um, you put southern, northern, and eastern together, and you approach 27%. Um, now, the other bar, the, you know, shows the population, so you can see, you know, relative shares of population, but most unfortunate is the green bar that shows medical research share. So despite having such huge burdens of disease, um, none of those bars in none of the regions, even in southern Africa, where South Africa obviously leads the way in research, um, still accounts for just around 8% of, um, of the world share um, of medical research. And this is between 2006 and 2015. So, you know, basically Africa is not doing enough research um, despite having a clear need for the outputs of research. And we need to begin to ask ourselves why this has happened, why it persists and what can be done to change this. Another way to look at research output is to think about patents. And in some ways, these are more, it's a better way to measure output because research output, as I showed you before, could be um, discussed in terms of publications. And as good as publications are, I am a basic scientist, um, it is also true that publications on their own don't necessarily translate into tools that improve people's lives. Even if you have a nature paper, um, it may be foundational to your field, it may you know, promote understanding of certain areas, but it doesn't necessarily, in the short term anyway, directly impact the lives of people who may be suffering certain diseases in your setting. Um, but when you think of patents, these are, you know, intellectual property that is registered, usually related to certain outputs, specific tangible outputs that you can measure. Now, unfortunately, here again, Africa lags way behind. 
In fact, in this case, Africa is less than 1%. So this figure is from uh, is taken from the WIPO office, so the World Intellectual Property Office. Um, and you can see that between 2009 and 2019, um, Asia, largely driven by China, showed a rapid increase in, in patent registration um, and basically intellectual property production. Um, over that time, Africa's share actually dropped from 0.7 to 0.5. Um, and Africa lags behind all other regions of the world um, in its intellectual property production. Now, the final thing I'll point out is um, on this slide is the, I don't know if I can find a pointer, but anyway, the, the squiggly line that goes up um, at the end is China. And that shows that for many, many decades, up until the beginning of the 2000s, China lagged behind much of the world. In fact, was on par with Africa in terms of um, patent registrations. And then suddenly with the, you know, the growth of the Chinese economy and the expansion in research, um, they've shown um, an exponential increase. So it shows what is possible when you mobilize funds and, and, and you grow. Now, of course, China has a, it's a massive country with lots of resources, but I think it just speaks to say that your condition today doesn't have to be your condition tomorrow, and that should be encouraging to those of us in Africa. A little bit more granularity on these numbers. Um, number of applic patent applications in Africa between 2009 and 2019 increased by only 4,000 applications. Contrast that with Asia, where you had an almost 1 million, um, 1 million application increase, so from 944,000 to 2 million. Um, and in other parts of the world, you had similar, similar sort of increases. So, you know, we see straight away from this table the problem that if um, Oceania, um, a relatively small and low populated uh, uh, continent, can register 35,000 patents. Um, a continent with 1.4 billion people should not be registering only 16,000. Now, we need to ask ourselves why this is the case. Why is Africa lagging behind so much in research outputs? Um, and I think one, one place to look um, is with funding and who, and, and sort of public funding, government funding, um, or as they call it here, gross domestic expenditure on R&D, um, the GERD. And in much of Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa, as I'm showing here, um, GERD is less than a percent. In fact, in Ghana, where I live and work, um, we are less than 0.5%. Um, Kenya is between 0.5 and 1%. You can see South Africa is also in that bracket. So we our governments are just not investing enough in research. Nigeria, which is, you know, such a large economy and the most populous country in the world invests less than 0.25% of its GDP on research. Now you contrast that to countries like the United States that invest 2.8% of GDP in research. Um, Malaysia, which in 1996 only invested 0.2, so it was the level of Nigeria, um, now invests 1.3%. And we all can attest to the growth that Malaysia has shown um, in that period. So, you know, you can't get research outputs without investing. We all, you know, anybody who's a scientist who's applied for a grant, who's bought reagents, knows how expensive the work that we do is. And it just is not possible to do without resources. Um, and unfortunately, whether it is due to lack of political will, lack of, of resources, lack of um, um, leadership, whatever the case may be, most African countries lag way behind when it comes to public investments in research. Now, South Africa is an example of a country that has 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 began to, and, and it, over the last few years, has consistently at least put some money into research. Um, and this figure, you know, which is taken from a World Bank publication, demonstrates that that money is being sp spent properly. So African scientists are actually increasing their output as GERD has increased. So the, the darker line, um, sorry, the, the, the lighter colored line shows the increase in, in basically government expenditure for research or from 96 all the way to 2008. And the dark line shows the number of publications. And you can see quite clearly that as the number, the amount of money being spent on research has increased, the number of publications and so a proxy for scientific output has also dramatically increased. Um, so, you know, this is only to 2008. I know that funding in South Africa for research has gone up and down. We see the stories about government cuts, but I think this figure should be used to 
drive home the point to politicians that you know South African scientists are working hard and when you invest in them they actually do achieve outputs and so this should be encouraged and should be adopted by many countries across the continent so if the governments don't fund research in Africa, then who funds research? And these names will be familiar to all of us. Um, you can see some of them are large public institutions in large developed countries like the US, um, and others are large philanthropic um, organizations and charities like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust. Um, I put the African Academy of Science here, not because, well, till recently they were they, they at least were coordinating a large amount of funding as funders are beginning to try to shift fund management to the continent. Unfortunately, um, that relationship has suffered a little bit in the last year. Um, and now there will probably be a new private African-based body that would administer grants. But um, with, with the exception of the African Academy of Science on this figure, all of these organizations are external to the continent. Um, and some of them actually represent government agencies of foreign countries. Um, so basically, Africa doesn't fund its own research. Um, and once again, from the, the, the paper I showed earlier uh, by Conferi and Wang, if you look at the different regions, um, this bar chart is basically showing the proportion of who is funding what types of research. And you can see at the very bottom is the amount that is public. So you can see Southern Africa, driven largely by South Africa, has at least, it looks like 25% of research is publicly is public African funded, so government, African governments. You can see all other regions are less than 10%. Um, the largest chunks, either we don't have any funding information or it is philanthropic organizations that would be Gates and Welcome and the like. Um, public non-African, so it's a big chunk in East Africa that is probably driven by either UK or US um, or other um, sort of uh, international government money, so NIH or um, uh, UKRI um, and other such organizations. So you can see quite clearly that the people who are funding research in Africa are not Africans themselves. Um, and that I think creates considerable problems when you think about sustainability, um, as well as who sets the goals for that research. If you don't pay for it, then how much say do you really have in what should be studied? And I think a number of us have, have, have felt the consequences of that imbalance in power. Um, and most recently with COVID, um, when these international, especially the public organizations tighten their budgets, the first programs to be cut are the ones that are in Africa. Um, as we found out with you know, the flare grants being sliced after the ODA in the UK was cut, a number of us were quite significantly affected by that. Um, but you can also not blame these funders because they are you know, they are beholden to their taxpayers who are domestic. And if budgets are tight, the first things to cut will be overseas aid. So the last few years, um, you know, African science has been on a lot of people's minds. There's been a lot of talk about capacity development, which is why I've circled it here. It's almost become a cliche. Um, every, every grant you submit, you have to say how you're building subcapacity. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a very important phrase, the shame that it's become maybe a bit diluted now because it, people misuse it or overuse it. Um, but when you think of African science, it's hard not to think the next few sentences would include something about capacity development. Um, but I think we have to ask, like, what kind of capacity are we developing? Um, you know, at this point, probably billions of dollars have been spent on building so-called capacity in African science. And yet we still find ourselves producing less than 3% of output. So are we just wasting the money or are we, what are we spending this money on? Or are we not really building the capacity we need? And I think that's where we need to ask ourselves about questions such as sustainability. Um, are these initiatives building, are they just fulfilling grant um, aims of grants or, or KPIs or, 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 or of, of funders? Um, and then when the funding is over, then the programs fold up or are we, are we building capacity for the future? Are we building sustainable um, 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 infrastructure? And in order for that to happen, then this infrastructure has to be contextually relevant. Um, you know, it has to, it has to understand the, the context in which it's working. Um, and in order for that to happen, it has to be African led. And I think this is the problem. A lot of our capacity development initi initiatives are not led from the continent because they're not funded from the continent. And so they then are weak, weak contextual frameworks. They are um, not adaptable 
Um, they are very specific to particular diseases or programs. And so when new challenges emerge, um, they, these programs find it very difficult to adapt and respond to emerging problems. And as such, ultimately, they're not sustainable. Um, so I think in, in my humble opinion, I think that is why with all the money you had that has been spent over the last few years on capacity development, Africa still really doesn't feel like it has moved very far forward. Uh, and I think that is because as well-meaning as these initiatives have been, they haven't been sufficiently led by African scientists and so have not been really relevant to the context. Now, another problem in Africa is the brain drain. Um, growing up as a child in high school in Ghana, we all heard about brain drain. You all hear about brain drain in universities. Um, unfortunately, I per, I'm of the opinion that the brain drain has gotten worse, not better, in the last 20 years. Um, and this is unfortunate because we've actually invested so much money in training African scientists. But if you look at the distribution of African scientists in the world, I suspect you find that there are currently more African scientists probably working abroad than before. Um, and what we've actually managed to do is to increase the cost of the brain drain. So what, what we've done by improving training on the continent is meaning that more people get advanced degrees from African institutions. We train more PhDs now in science than we've ever done. And yet we don't have more PhDs necessarily working on the continent. And that is because all our capacity de developing initiatives, mostly donor funded, have focused heavily on training and have focused very little on what happens after you train. Um, it's all about we need a thousand or ten thousand PhDs. Actually, you need a thousand more scientists working in Africa. Um, the PhD is just a pathway to get there. But if, if you only focus on the training component, if all the money, if the whole fellowship that the student receives ends when they graduate, then you've created a highly trained um, um, unemployed person because there are not enough jobs to absorb our talent, there are not enough exciting opportunities for these people to practice their science outside of academia. So the universities cannot absorb everyone. The universities themselves are poorly funded and so pay very poor salaries. Um, and there's very little funding for research internally. So you end up creating more and more people who are competing for the same resources um, to, to allow themselves to do research. And in my opinion, that is creating an imbalance that is actually worsening the brain drain. And because now, they, have, they are leaving at after a master's or a PhD, you've actually made the brain drain more expensive because you used to lose them after a first degree or after high school, now you lose them after a graduate degree. So and I think this is really because training programs, and a number of people have been fighting this for a long time, training programs have to think beyond simply the degree. You have to have resources to allow somebody to transition into a researcher role. There should be some provision made for postdocs. It's very difficult. It has been very difficult to get capacity building grants from funders to fund postdocs. They would rather fund PhDs and fund 300 PhDs than fund 10 postdocs. Um, but ultimately, I think the postdocs are probably much more important when you talk about establishing a research ecosystem. So what can we do? And this is where I have come to believe commercial research or biotech has a big role to play. Um, if you look at models in Europe and in North America, biotech occupies um, sort of the middle ground between academia and big pharma, um, where innovations that are developed in the bench in an academic setting are developed further, are, are, are moved up in the sort of innovation and development pipeline. And ultimately, the goal is to have them acquired um, or taken over by big biotech or big pharma. Um, without that bridge, without those startups that take, you know, these, these ideas forward, many things would end up, you know, on dusty shelves in, in, or in libraries. Um, so the innovation and translation pipeline depends on commercial startups, biotech startups, driven by young, innovative people um, who um, want to create products to impact people's lives. Now, in many parts of the world, this is highly successful. I mean, yes, of course, many biotech startups don't, don't succeed, but it is still now almost a $700 billion industry. Um, unfortunately, in Africa and the Middle East, it's only about 18 billion. And in fact, much of Africa really lacks much of any biotech industry. So as, I, as we bemoan the lack of support for academic research, the lack of opportunities for the trainees that come out of our training programs, I think biotech 
presents at least one solution to this problem. Biotech potentially creates an avenue to absorb um, the talent that we're, we're producing, but also will allow us to begin to think more innovatively and, and more about how to translate our science, not purely as academic scientists who want to publish, but really thinking about how we can impact people's lives. Um, and I believe finally, biotech has the role in pulling big pharma. Um, that is not that is not going to change. Um, However, uh, you know, I think what what can what, what Africa needs is to begin to be more on the more at the table when we think about pharma, um, and the way we do that is by having biotech companies doing innovative work that will catch the eye of these big pharma companies and get them to take Africa seriously as a force in the global research pipeline. So, with those considerations in mind, um, in well, June of 2020, I began to think about um, what I wanted to do. I'd returned to Ghana um, as an academic. I had taken up a position at the University of Ghana um, doing research at, um, you know, arguably probably the best academic research center um, in Ghana um, and certainly the most productive at the moment. Um, but I began to be frustrated by just the, 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 the pace of work within the university. Um, and I, 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 I felt myself becoming a little bit jaded and at risk of rejoining the brain drain. And so I asked myself, what else could I do as a scientist with the experience that I had? Um, and I settled on biotech. I basically made the decision that um, if I wanted to have an impact, I might as well try to see what I could do outside of academia, um, whether it would be possible to raise funds to you know, to do exciting research in Africa for Africans, um, but then driven and led by Africans. Um, and so that is what Yamachi stands for. Um, we in particular are focused on cancer, and I'll tell you a little bit about why we pick cancer. But our thesis is really to diversify precision oncology, both in terms of new diagnostics and then also new therapies for cancer. So, in telling you about what Yamachi stands for and why um, we established the company, um, you have to understand something about the lack of diversity in precision medicine that exists currently. Majority of genomic data that's available, and I'm sure this is no secret to um, colleagues at ICGB, um, is seven, majority of global genome data is 78%, is, is European. So 78 to 80% of global data that's available is from people of European ancestry only 2.4% is from people of African descent. And you can see really every other um, ethnicity is really po very poorly represented. Now in Africa in particular, less than 2% of clinical trials happen on, in, in, in people of African descent. So this is meaning that precision medicine, um, and in this case, precision oncology, which is supposed to be tailor-made for an individual, supposed to get away from the issues you have with one size fits all therapies and diagnostics, is actually potentially exacerbating the disparities that we see. Um, because the data sets upon which these precision tools um, were developed is so skewed, um, it, it, it actually disenfranchises a large segment of, of the population, especially um, Black people. And so there is a clear problem. Um, and you know I think people are beginning to make more and more noise about this problem. But the issue is it's one thing to identify what the problem is, another thing to figure out what to do about it. So yes, precision medicine needs to become more diverse. And the question is, how do we make precision medicine more diverse? Now, the solution to that, I would say, is Africa. Um, Africa is the home of genetic diversity. Africa is the home to the most genetically diverse human population anywhere in the world. Um, in fact, Africa is home to the oldest human lineages in many ways. Um, I'm, I'm not a population geneticist or genomicist, but I, I think this is quite widely understood. And this is a publication that came out in October 2020, where you know 400 whole genomes led to the discovery of 3 million new variants. So 400 African genomes set against 100 million or so genomes done previously, um, and you find 3 million new variants. You don't need to be a geneticist to understand that you're dealing with a very, very diverse and a really, really uncharacterized population. So if you say precision medicine is not diverse, then I say the solution is 
we need to re- do more research in Africa. And so that's what Yamachi is aiming to do. Now we have focused on cancer for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, cancer morbidity is borne disproportionately by people of African descent, whether they live in Europe or North America or they live in Africa. Um, black, you know, breast cancer in black women is, is, appears to be more fatal. Um, the death rates um, in black men for prostate cancer are twice that of any other ethnicity. And then we think of pediatric cancers on the African continent. Um, we are languishing at less than 40% cure rate when in Europe and North America, you're looking at over 90% cure rate. Now, of course, some of these are socioeconomically driven. Um, they're not all genetic, but I think there's a clear component um, and there's a clear, um, there's a clear role for lack of adequate trials, lack of adequate development of tools that would work in, in our populations. <clears throat> now, cancer, even though it's not mentioned as often in Africa as perhaps the typical infectious disease, um, um, you know, infectious diseases that, that grab the headlines like malaria, TB, and HIV, um, cancer deaths are actually significantly on the rise across Africa. And in many ways are moving in the opposite direction to infectious diseases. As our populations age, thankfully due, due to advances in, in healthcare that allow us to, you know, to recover from some of the infectious diseases that we encounter, um, unfortunately, as you get older, then your risk for cancer also increases. So Africa is at this you know, interesting transition where we, we are transitioning from infectious to non-infectious causes of morbidity um, and actually currently have, you know, have one of the fastest growing rates of cancer-related morbidity anywhere in the world and have some of the highest cancer-related mortalities anywhere in the world. Uh, now, mortality of, of cancer in Africa is driven by a number of factors, including late diagnosis. Um, you know, a lot of people present at very advanced stages. Um, as you can see from the breast cancer data I'm showing on this slide. Um, and that obviously affects um, people's survival. Um, but I believe that also creates an important opportunity uh, because majority of oncology research is actually focused on late stage cancers. So on the African continent, you have now the most diverse human population anywhere in the world. You have a large treatment naive cancer population um, and you have many people presenting at late stages. So all of these factors create, you know, an unfortunate um, mix that actually is, is, is begging for scientific research and actually should make Africa one of the centers of oncology research. Unfortunately, though, at this point, that is not happening. Um, but Yamachi hopes to do something about that. So our goal is to diversify precision oncology. Um, and very simply, we do this by trying to study cancer among people of African descent. Um, we look to work with clinicians across Africa to collect and sequence samples from cancer patients. Um, and re really, we're aiming to build up the world's most diverse knowledge base on cancer, um, combining um, aggregate clinical data with molecular data from these patients to really build a clear understanding of, of cancer in these populations and use this as, um, as, as the foundation for um, for new biomarker discovery, for drug target discovery, for optimizing existing diagnostic and, and, and treatment tools um, to ensure that they work. Of course, they work in people of African descent, but given the diversity on our continent, really, this is about making sure that these tools work for all people. Um, and I think it's a nice, I particularly find it almost romantic that the idea is that by studying cancer in Africa, you actually study cancer around the world. And this is basically could potentially be a gift of Africa to the world to really understand cancer across multiple um, different geographies. So that is the main driver or ethos behind um, Yamachi. And as I said, our model is really built on partnership. We are not, you know, we, we ourselves, are, with the exception of one person on our team, are not clinicians. Um, so we aim to bring research to the African clinician, to the African oncologist, um, and to partner with them to really understand cancer in their populations. Now, one aspect of our work also is molecular diagnostic service provision. Um, we are primarily a cancer research company. However, because of the context in which we work, and I talked about context when I was discussing capacity development, um, because we are African scientists or African people and we understand the sheer lack of molecular diagnostic capacity in many of the countries in which we work, it would be highly irresponsible and actually very difficult for us to do what we do without addressing that gap. 
So the role at Yamachi, what we're trying to do at Yamachi is to leverage some of the capacity we are building in next generation sequencing and molecular biology um, to improve access to molecular diagnostic services in the countries in which we work. This provides direct value to our, our partners, being the clinicians and the patients. Um, so it provides immediate value, but then also sets up opportunities for us to then work with these people to, to, to better understand the cancers they have through the research activities that we do. So really, I like to think of it as a model of research fueled by diagnostic services and then diagnostic services obviously informed by research, because as our research grows, we can improve the quality of the diagnostic service we provide because now these tools will be better optimized for our population. And by providing molecular diagnostics on the African continent, you begin to tackle some of the big challenges that currently um, really, really complicate cancer management. Um, cancer management these days is very molecular in focus. We're moving away from simply depending on classical pathology. Um, but in Africa, you're still treating cancer almost blind because you don't have access to molecular oncology. Um, the challenge is molecular oncology is viewed as overly expensive on Af in Africa because all the samples are shipped abroad. You know, you send samples to Europe, to the US, maybe sometimes within Africa, the one place you could send is maybe South, South, South Africa. But in general, our samples are shipped around the world, which affects the affordability of the, the, the test, affects the accessibility, and obviously also affects the accuracy because Africa is a very minor part of a minor piece of the test population. And so the data that is used to further optimize these tests does not really include our populations. And ultimately, this affects the actionability of this data. Um, you know, what's the point of finding out you're a good candidate for a uh, um, uh, a, a, a kinase inhibitor if that kinase inhibitor is not available in your market. But I believe that the two is sort of the chicken and the egg. Drug companies are only going to sell targeted therapies in an, a market in which they know that there is good um, companion diagnostics to identify good candidate patients. Um, so I believe that by providing molecular oncology diagnostics on the African continent, we can address the accessibility, affordability, and accuracy. And then we are in a position now to act, address the actionability, which would be about engaging with pharma companies to improve access to their drugs um, on the African continent. So this is another part of Yamachi's work. As I said, primarily we are a research company, but we have a mission to improve the lives of people in Africa. And we believe that we can do this by improving their access to molecular oncology diagnostics. Very briefly, I'm mindful of the time. Um, you know, we are an all African team, but we're not all Ghanaian, even though our headquarters is in Ghana. We have um, representation from, uh, from East Africa, from other West African countries, Frankfurt, West Africa, um, Ethiopia. Um, and we all represent Africans who many of us trained abroad and have found our way back to the continent. Um, and we look to grow. The diaspora is going to be a, has been a key source of funding for us and has also been a key source of talent. And so we look forward to creating opportunities to begin to reverse the brain drain by giving, giving talented Africans opportunities to come back um, and then themselves become a stopgap against the brain drain by providing opportunities for young Africans who, may, who then don't necessarily ever need to leave the continent. We established, so as I said, the, we, we actually began operations in March of 2021. So we're only about a year old in terms of operational age. Um, we have uh, a ne next generation of molecular, a molecular diagnostic lab set up in Accra. These are a few pictures from our lab. Um, and are currently fully licensed to provide uh, molecular diagnostic services in Ghana um, and are looking to expand our footprint. In speaking of that footprint, we realized very early on that Ghana is a relatively small country. It's home for some of us, and it's a great place to visit if any of you have never been. But it's also not, it's, you know, uh, Yamachi's vision is much bigger than just Ghana. So we've been working very hard to establish partnerships across the continent. Um, currently have relationships ongoing in six African countries. Um, we have a partnership with the University of Cape Town, H3D, uh, a project that we are, we are about to launch, um, looking at um, liver function, um, and how it affects drug metabolism. Um, and we have a number of other partnerships um, actually beyond the continent. So a key part of our model is to bring African research to the world. And we do this by partnering with academic and other institutions um, in Europe and North America. So we currently have MOUs and agreements with biotech companies in the US, biotech companies in South Africa, um, as well as a whole host of organizations in Africa. 
We have five active research projects. So this is all since um, March, 2021. Um, we, I, um, Lara mentioned the grant from the Gates Foundation. I actually applied for this fellowship from Yamachi. So what I pitched was the idea that this grant would be administered and um, and the project, well, project be administered, the grant managed by a young African startup. Um, and after some discussion, they, they went for it. And I think potentially it, it presents a new model or at least an additional model for how research in Africa can be done. You don't always have to run it through a large academic institution. There may be some utility sometimes in doing it through a small company like ours. Um, and then in, we're really excited that in the first week of February, we began our sequencing and we actually um, sequenced the first whole exomes of cancers ever sequenced completely in Ghana. Um, so this was quite a big, a, a big, a, a big first for us just earlier this year. And that work is ongoing as we look to, as I said, create what I like to think of as the real cancer cancer genome atlas. I find it hard to think of a cancer genome atlas that is predominantly Caucasian being an atlas. So Yamachi is actually building the actual cancer genome atlas. Um, no offense to the NIH, but um, yeah. Um, one, another project I'll tell you about briefly is the AMBER project. This is a partnership with a Bay Area um, US-based um, liquid biopsy diagnostic um, molecular oncology company. Um, they have a liquid biopsy, which is basically a blood test for cancer. Um, and it's in use in the US, it's in use in, in Asia, but I've never been evaluated in a predominantly black population. And given the aggressive nature of breast cancer among black women, we thought it was important to try to do something in this area. So we're doing a small pilot study we're recruiting a small number of women with end stage, so stage three, late stage cancer, stage three and four um, breast cancer. And we're evaluating the liquid biopsy against um, tissue uh, biopsy in terms of um, sequencing tissue. Um, and we're looking really for identifying actionable markers, so things that could direct therapy, um, but then also we'll be, we'll be doing whole exome sequencing and ultimately whole genome sequencing to identify potential new drivers of cancer. Uh, preliminary results of this are quite encouraging. 40% of the women actually had actionable mutations. So I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, Africa is actually a good place to begin. In addition to potentially finding new drivers, it's actually a good place to understand the function of existing um, mutations that are known to drive cancer. Um, you know, it's a good place to conduct trials to understand how these new targeted therapies could potentially work. Um, and of course, identifying 40% of the women with actionable mutations means there's also a good market um, for, uh, you know, um, some of these more advanced targeted therapies for cancer, provided, of course, the economics can be worked out. But as we've shown, economics should never stand in the way of, of doing good, uh, of providing healthcare. Um, antiretrovirals were thought to be non-cost effective um, early 2000s, cost $100,000 to treat a single patient. Now, it costs less than $100 to treat a patient. Um, so where there's a will, there's a way. And I think once we show that there's a good population of people who could benefit from these drugs, I believe that um, that will be addressed. And then finally, there's the Heritage Project, which is my Gates uh, Fellowship, uh, which we're running through Yamachi. Um, you can see our little logo uh, with the antibody with the Kana flag. Um, and basically, this is a non-cancer project. The Gates Foundation currently do not fund non chronicle disease research. They primarily focus on infectious diseases. Um, but we decided to do a, a project that still was of benefit to the African continent um, because historically and anecdotally, vaccine efficacy in Africa is known to be lower than in Europe or North America, even with the same vaccines. And yet it's never really been, we never had the opportunity to really understand the mechanism. There are a number of hypotheses about why this might be the case. So what we're doing with Heritage is, you know, taking advantage of COVID where everybody has had to have either an AstraZeneca or a Pfizer vaccine. Um, and basically we, we're following a cohort of 300 adults who have been vaccinated. Um, we're taking multiple samples from these people at different times over the course of 12 months and really doing what I believe will be the deepest, most comprehensive phenotyping of an immune response in an African vaccination, a vaccinated cohort. And we're partnering with the Crick to compare it with a similar cohort of UK vaccinees in the Legacy project that is a project run by the Crick. Um, so Heritage and Legacy working together to really begin to understand the potential mechanisms that underlie different uh, vaccine efficacies among, among, among different geographic regions, uh, which hopefully will then direct better vaccine design um, going forward.
this is just sort of a you know, study design um, of, of, of heritage. So to recap, you know, an idea in my mind, 2018, 2019, registered the company in Ghana in 2020, then began looking for money operationally, operational from March 2021. We were admitted to Y Combinator, which is probably one of the most prestigious accelerator programs in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, uh, Airbnb is a product of Y Combinator, so we're in relatively good company um, in the summer of 2021. And currently in 2022, we now have relationships in, uh, in, uh, in six African countries. So we're quite proud of, um, of this progression. We still have a long way to go, but I think it, it, it demonstrates um, that you can, you know, you're willing to work hard enough and um, you're willing to chase an idea. Um, I think you can have um, some, you can have success working within Africa and doing things slightly differently from what has been done before. So just quick lessons learned so far. Um, grad school teaches you nothing about entrepreneurship. So I have had a, you know, as CEO, I've, I, I'm blessed to be surrounded by some of my, you know, my team who are actually non-scientists and have experience in, this, in, in business and in finance. But I've had to learn a lot very, very quickly to be a, you know, to pass muster as a CEO when I talk to investors. Because everything that we've done at Yamachi, I should add, um, is, is investor funded. So the grant was a nice bonus, but we closed a $3 million seed round that was raised all from investors, many of whom actually initially were diasporan Africans, and then following up with some professional investors and venture capital funds. Um, but as, a, as an immunologist, I've had to learn how to talk like, you know, talk the language of, of venture capital. Um, it's been exciting, but it's been quite challenging. And I'll just say anybody wanting to do this, uh, maybe we need to add some MBA courses to our grad school lineup. Um, Planning and extensive consultation are key. I've learned a lot from people. Um, I had to, you know, had to seek advice and I'd encourage anyone who's going to try to do this as a scientist to recognize your own limitations and be very willing to get advice from as many people as you can. Rejection happens. As a scientist, I think we, are, we learn to deal with rejection because you're, it's very rare to find someone who's never been rejected for a grant application. Um, but, you know, yeah, so I guess in some ways it prepared me, but still it's really difficult when you spend a month or two courting an investor only for it to fall through at the end. Um, but you don't give up, you keep going, you accept that, you know, uh, that is going to happen along the way. Um, you have to learn to uh, and adapt constantly. The vision of Yamachi has matured considerably. Um, we've, we've, we've not really pivoted, but we've sort of improved and I think um, uh, refined the model um, and we'll continue to do so over the coming years. Um, but I think you have to learn to be, you know, you have to be willing to learn and adapt. Um, and team is crucial. I've been very blessed to be able to recruit a really fantastic team around me and we continue to recruit. Uh, currently have 30 employees all together um, working at Yamachi. Um, but it's right to find the right people, people you fit with, people you gel with, and ultimately people who share your belief. Um, because what is driving us forward is our shared vision of what we believe Yamachi can be. Um, and I think that is very, very important. Um, I always tell, you know, many of my team are working for steep salary cuts right now because um, we're a startup and we have to save our resources for the work we're doing. The only reason they do this is because they believe where we're going. Um, actually, our very first employee started working, she quit her job and started working for Yamachi for no pay for a few months before we could afford to pay her. Now that is, you know, if that's not, bordering on crazy i don't think i don't know what it is but that is like level of belief that you need um, as a team to make some of these things happen and i believe that we will honor that sacrifice with our success going forward so with the last sort of three minutes um what i'd like to do is talk about something that i think is very relevant to africa right now you've heard you know, I started off by telling you about the gaps we have in African research. I've talked about my own personal journey in trying to set up a biotech company. Um, I think what I'd like to now end with is asking the question that's on everybody's mind is, has COVID actually been good for African science? Um, I would say the answer is yes and no. And I think we have to be very careful um, where we take our COVID response. Um, you know, I put up these two, uh, these two headlines because I think we, uh, my personal, and I, 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 this, is, this is where I, I hope to spark some debate. Um, my personal reaction has been that our African COVID response, while being great at times, has also been incredibly reactive. Um, and we're beginning to see the, 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 the unfortunate 
result of that reactivity with the news coming out, especially in South Africa, of lack of demand for the COVID vac manufacturing um, or the COVID vaccines being manufactured in the African continent. Um, these are two separate factories that are facing a slump because of this lack of ordering. Um, and so I think, you know, when we think about, you know, the response to COVID, yes, there's been a lot of great science, a lot of great papers that have come out, and there's been overwhelmingly this push. Maybe the single biggest thing is Africa needs to make its own vaccines. While I don't disagree with that, I think it is a very simplistic argument just to focus purely on just vaccine manufacturing. And I think what we're seeing now with the drop in demand for COVID vaccines and the impact this is potentially going to have on these vaccine factories that were set up very quickly um, is, is because we cannot simply focus on just the vaccine manufacturing. You have to think more holistically. So my first reflection is vaccine manufacturing alone is not enough. We can't if, COVID, if the only thing COVID leaves Africa with is a bunch of vaccine manufacturing factories, it's actually a mistake. We have to think more holistically about what Africa needs from a biomedical research perspective, which will, of course, include vaccine development capacity, but simply focusing exclusively on making vaccines, in many cases, making other people's vaccines, is really a little bit short-sighted and hasn't been very well thought through, even from the simple economics of will there be enough demand if every country in Africa is making its own vaccines. I think African governments are still too slow to act. We still don't have national molecular epidemiological surveillance systems that we should have. I think those are to be more useful than building vaccine factories everywhere. Um, funding is still all external. Africa CDC has done great work, but if you look for where that money has come from, it's largely from the Gates Foundation and other philanthropic organizations. African governments are still not putting money into research, even though they have seen what can happen when we don't have sufficient capacity. But we can't count on help from the West. As I said before, many of us have suffered when you depend entirely on funding from the West. And so it's very disappointing that our governments are still not putting enough money into research. I believe that indigenous African public and private research initiatives are crucial. More and more, we have to be Africa-centric and we have to be Africa-led and initiated. There may be small initiatives to start with, but I think these are the ones that actually ultimately will stand the test of time because our initiatives in science have to be innovative and we have to, we have to think long-term. Um, I think currently the vaccine manufacturing drive, it's a little bit of short-term buzz in my, my opinion, and I'm open to be challenged on this. But you know, if you were serious about building vaccine capacity, you would think about R&D for vaccine development, you'd think about downstream uh, um, distribution and logistics. Just simply focusing on having enough factories to do fill and finish um, demonstrates short-term thinking for me. Um, Bright Simmons, who's a well-known Ghanaian sort of uh, thinker, I would call him, um, an entrepreneur, calls it epiphanic thinking. Um, it's sort of, oh, we should do this because everybody, it's, it's a good idea, but you haven't really thought through it very well. And I think if we have enough locally driven initiatives where it's grassroots, it's young African scientists, thinking through problems and responding to problems they see around them, we have much more likelihood of success than big blockbuster initiatives that take one part of the problem and focus on it without looking at the whole system, as a, without looking at the system as a whole. So with that, I'd just like to thank you all. I hope, I've, I hope this has been useful. Um, and I hope that you will um, have some um, ideas about um, about maybe the way forward for Africa. Um, so happy to have some discussion um, and I hope this has been useful as we celebrate Africa Day and are, are hopeful ultimately about Africa's continued ascendancy and the, you know, the, the future that we hope for our continent. Thank you very much.